this is probably going to be a slightly different take than we've seen on uh, on open data so far today. Although I obviously um, are going going to end up repeating some things that other speakers have said, most notably Kevin from the DCC, I think made some extremely valid points. Whereas he uh, appealed to your selfishness, I am going to appeal to your altruism. So uh, hopefully we're going to get a good mix by the end of the afternoon. Uh, so uh, you, you've trumped my first bit of my talk, so I don't have to actually explain who I am, which usually takes, as you see, a couple of minutes. So we'll go, we'll go straight into uh, some of the uh, observations. So research management and research data management, it's a really, really fascinating issue and that's why we're all here. Um, if you actually start thinking about this quite deeply, a lot of the problems that we're seeing are age-old problems. Uh, my, my example here of modern research data interface uh, is a wax tablet from uh, Greek and Roman, the height of the classical civilization. Um, not great for data sharing, had all sorts of problems in volatility, but this medium was designed to basically work for a day. You would use your wax tablet to describe your, your words or your calculations, you'd leave it out in the sun, and the data would go away. And, you know, with many of our experiences over the last few years with uh, floppy disks, magnetic drives, things like this, effectively you can just walk past a mobile phone and all your data will go away. So there are a lot of parallels and a lot of similarities in terms of how far we've advanced. We have more interesting technology, we have more um, uh, elevated technology, but we still experience a lot of the same issues. And so in starting to think through these issues, I think it's actually good to, to start thinking in a historical context. And sharing is, is actually a really interesting case in point. Sharing is something that's really difficult to ingrain in a society. And the, the uh, example that I've got on the screen now is a really fascinating one. For those of you who don't know, this particular book, Optics by Isaac Newton, uh, was delayed in publication for around 30 years. Newton put out uh, Principia and uh, got some quite scathing feedback from a colleague named Robert Hooke, no relation of mine. <laughs> um, <coughs> in fact, the, the comment on who someone else's talk is, is based on the shoulders of giants. Uh, this, is, this is actually a put down by Hooke, because uh, by, by Newton, because Hooke was a very short man and he wanted to particularly exclude Hooke from being built on, as it were. Uh, but this is, this is a fascinating case, in that Newton had shared that early piece of work, he had had the feedback of society, there had been debate and discussion about it, um, and some of the discussion from Hooke had been less than generous and hadn't really recognised the genius of the work. And so specifically to spite Hooke, this work came out in 1704, uh, which was one year after Hooke died. So this is not necessarily a good model for how we want to share work. But I think there's, a, there's an interesting paradigm in which we, we start to see a kind of a form coming out. And so the way I, I think of uh, open data is a little bit like this diagram. So if you consider the annulus that I've got on the screen, this is kind of the expanding wavefront of open data, of data being produced. So if we consider the outer circumference of the circle, all the things that we're currently working on, all the things that we're currently discovering, and all the data we're aggregating, this is the kind of the outer wavefront of what we're working on. And then there's a period of time when the data is being processed, we've got it under embargo, we're working out how to publish it, how to work with it, and some pieces of data never come out of that annulus. They always stay in the closed status for very good reasons that other people have discussed. And at some point, hopefully, a lot of data falls into the centre of that annulus. And so we have a kind of overall capability to do work around curation and processing of, of that complete body of work from its discovery all the way into the middle. But we all know that there are big problems around the drivers associated with uh, actually doing processing of data and being open about our data. And I think this is one of the points that I want to think about. Kevin uh, appealed to your, to your better nature, uh, your, your less good natures. He said, be selfish about it, it's going to be good for you. What I'm going to say is, you know, none of us go into science, or certainly I didn't go into science, 
for the uh, for the money. I certainly didn't go into science for the for the kind of the glory. I went into science because I thought that there was a genuine opportunity to do something that might improve the lot of mankind. Now, perhaps I'm terribly naive, but I think a lot of people go into science for that reason. And not just science, humanities and arts as well. It's not just about us. And I think there's an interesting argument in there. If you're going to believe that, then why should you be precious about your data? You shouldn't be precious about your data, because if we're going to really believe that we're in it for humanity rather than ourselves, then we are in it to make sure that the things we produce are maximally used and are maximally beneficial. And that means that you should share your data, very simply and very obviously. Because whilst you've had the capacity to create the data, you've had the insight to create the experiment, you've had the money to create the apparatus that you need, going the next step along may not be best done by you. You may not be the best person to do the analysis. You may not have the software uh, experience. You may not have the calculational tools. You may not have the mathematical background required. There are all sorts of tools that you, I mean, it would be, um, uh, very bad to assume that you had all of these capabilities in one team or one person. So making the data available makes it maxim gives you the maximal opportunity for it to be positively reused. And so by the very nature of, of creating those data, you almost have a responsibility to make it openly available, and openly available that others can utilise and others can exploit, because they may be able to move things on faster than you're capable of moving things on. And that really leads to the second problem that we see. So assuming everybody is, is as selfless as, as, as they should be, um, then how do you gain credit uh, so that you can continue, at the very least, to do what you're doing? Because these days we all know that scientific progression or progression in other, other academic areas uh, really relies on you're getting a paper in nature, you're getting a paper in science, you're producing the monograph in the social science um, uh, publisher of your choice. So these are the kind of reputational, and I thought the, the use of the word reputation economy is particularly good and accurate in this context. Um, working that economy is a big issue for us. And right now, those big journals and those big publishers have uh, kind of the key to the esteem in the industry. So one of the interesting things that has happened over the last few years that I think has moved the conversation along quite a long way from 1975 or whenever it was that impact factors started coming out um, is research evaluation. And research evaluation has been both, I think, quite positive and quite negative for the industry. On the one hand, it has pushed an agenda. It's made us open up about data. It's made us uh, think more positively about whether we want journal-level metrics or article-level metrics. There's now an abundance of different metrics available. It's not just citations. We might want to think about tweets, blog articles, news attention associated with articles. And all of this, I view, as kind of a, a multi-dimensional <coughs> metric uh, telling us about how data and how articles are being looked at and viewed. So research evaluation, I think, has been quite positive in that way. In another way, it's been quite negative because it tends to favour uh, research which is applied. It tends to favour research which is more used rather than blue skies research. And I think everybody admits that blue skies research and that spectrum all the way through applied research is quite needed. I think the kind of the worst case scenario hasn't yet been realised, but certainly the REF in the UK has pushed towards support of popular research rather than good research. And this, the definition of quality is, is, is an extremely difficult thing to get a handle on. Everybody in the sector knows this and everybody is sensitive to it. Uh, the danger of going too far down a path is really quite marked. But in 2008, we uh, had a new driver in the system. Um, the UK uh, ability to fund research significantly decreased as a result of bailing the banks out. As a theoretical physicist, I, uh, I decided not to go into the banking world because I, 
understand that my uh, uh, ability with mathematics can be used in positive as well as negative ways. Um, and I felt I would be less dangerous in research evaluation and research management. Uh, draw your own conclusions. Um, but uh, research evaluation is, is, is a fascinating one in this context because this is where the impact agenda has come from in the UK, I think. I mean, we've been interested in trying to calculate and work out some metric to quantify the impact of research for many, many years. This has been a, um, a goal of government in the UK probably since as far back as the 1960s. But research evaluation in itself has really come on quite significantly since about 2005, 2006 with the uh, creation of impact. And of course, impact is something that you have to be very, very careful about. Um, we see all sorts of different forms of impact, so much so that um, about 18 months ago now, Nature published a special issue just on impact and trying to work out what impact meant in different scenarios to different stakeholders. Uh, I actually view some of this as attention rather than impact, and I like to make a differentiation between the two. Things that we see coming out of PLOS and their article level metrics, altmetric.com, um, things that we see coming out of impact story, typically I view as attention. And it typically tends to be media attention and news attention rather than scholarly attention, which we think of more classically as served by our colleagues at Scopus and Web of Science through citation. Um, and other types of impact associated with uh, economic impact, which things like Star Metrics Project in America try to uh, get a bearing on. Most recently, the UK have actually produced their uh, impact case studies and made them available online. This is a project that we were fortunate enough to be part of. Uh, and this allows you to start looking through case studies in the UK and seeing what came out of the 7,000 or so case studies that were returned to the REF exercise. And the interesting thing about this was the work that was done by the review panels seems to have been done quite sympathetically. They were looking um, for impact in a very broad sense. They were trying to classify things in terms of social outcomes, not just economic outcomes. They were looking at drug discovery, as well as very local or regional forms of impact around um, particular events or particular conferences. So it's really quite a subtle environment to work in. And this is one of the big challenges in starting to get these, these different data sets together. Uh, this is just a, a kind of uh, a summary of the, the kind of the view of the of the landscape that I have. So that's kind of the the outline that I want to give you of impact at a very high level. So it's this thing that we can't quite get a handle on. It means many things to many people. Lots of people have slightly different understandings of what impact is, and people it it tends to be slightly difficult to define. Is this economic outcome impact, or is it uh, industry collaboration? Is industry collaboration in and of itself impact? So there are lots of questions around this. On the other end of things, we have, for a long time, uh, been very successful now at big collaboration. And I think that research in and of itself has moved uh, a long way since, since the Greek tablet. So uh, a colleague of mine, Jonathan Adams, wrote a comment in Nature a couple of years ago, and he defined four ages of research. Um, and I'm going to steal shamelessly from, from this article and also for the title of my talk, as you've seen. Jonathan decided that the first age of research is really where you do research on your own. This is where you shut yourself in a room, you uh, think deep thoughts, and you try and write this up very much in the way that Newton did. Uh, and which was essentially the prevalent way of doing research till most way through last century. So only things like the Manhattan Project and really big projects started building together on a, on a, on a scale that was more than just the individual. And today there are still research areas which are best done as individual pursuits, some areas of pure maths, some areas in social art, sciences, arts and humanities. But then you move to a second paradigm, which is the institutional level of research. So you start doing research uh, within your department, and you start working with other departments. 
And this we've been quite good at again, probably in the latter half of last century, so 19, uh, the 20th century, we were doing, starting to do some interesting things, and you start getting people talking about multidisciplinary research. And then as you get really towards the end of the century, we start doing national and international level of research. And international, the, the flavour of international research that we see certainly in the UK publications profile that you see around the world now, is that it's many papers now have at least one international author on it from whose ever pers perspective you're looking at. But this become, comes with a unique set of challenges you now have multiple funders in multiple jurisdictions and multiple countries funding projects. So who owns the data associated with the project? Does anybody really own the data? And if you start thinking about ownership in quite a parochial way, you start coming up with all sorts of issues that encumber your ability to collaborate and encumber your ability to share. So my pithy kind of way of remembering this is that you start off with the age of enlightenment, uh, you move to the age of evaluation. We then had the age of collaboration, and the age of enlightenment, uh, the age of evaluation, and the age of, of, of collaboration have run somewhat in parallel. But I think collaboration is something that's happening more and more, and is emergent property international collaboration. And then the age of impact is the age that we've transitioned into or are currently going into. But I view the age of impact as a slight step backwards compared to the age of collaboration, certainly in its current form. If we're not very, very careful about this, we start failing to collaborate internationally because our own governments and our own funders have a thirst to understand impact at a level that we can't explain to them effectively within national boundaries. And this is a real danger, I think, for the, whole, uh, for the whole area that we work in. So having excellent ways of collaborating, excellent met methodologies behind curation of data, saving of data, sharing of data, things that give us roots back to show how people have collaborated, is in essence, I think, the foundation of a more evolved form of evaluation that we'll see in a new age yet to come. Of course, big experiments like CERN are probably not the problem. Everybody uh, who's invested in CERN has typically done so at a national level. It's actually this problem that's the really scary one. This is what I call the small data problem, or my colleague Mark Hannell calls the long tail problem. I think mine's a much sexier way of putting it. Um, <laughs> So small data is all the data that the researchers at your institutions are producing and storing on a pen drive or are dropping into Dropbox or Box or whatever other cloud sourced uh, capability they want to use. And this is the bit that should really scare you because we have no knowledge of it. It's invisible to us. It's like the, uh, like the dark matter problem in the universe. You know, the universe appears to be made up only of a very tiny percent of the stuff that we see. And if we take the stuff on Figshare and the stuff on Dryad and the stuff on all of the open repositories, this is probably 3% of what we actually want to know about. And it's the 97% that's hidden on thumb drives and in people's desk drawers and the stuff that's carefully backed up by taking a copy home that's really going to be the stuff that actually makes the difference and actually makes us able to shortcut the reproducibility problems that we're having. The stuff where people should be sharing negative results as well as positive results to save other researchers the time of reproducing those negative results. So as so many things, I think this problem can be attacked at an institutional level. I think institutions have sufficient numbers of drivers and sufficient numbers of ways of interacting with their academics that they can take the conversation to the academic in a positive way and make it pay off for them. I think one side of that discussion is evolving the promotion process to ensure that people who are involved with producing, manicuring and working with data get the credit that they deserve. But all too often we find people who are merely ticking the box. I talk to lots of institutions internationally and I go and uh, ask them about how they're interacting with their data, what types of systems they're putting in place, 
how they would want to get their academics on board. And typically, I see three types of institution. I see a type of institution who has been given a funding mandate and they absolutely need to comply with that funding mandate by a certain date. They lack the resources to do very much more than that and consequently they invest in systems and infrastructure that tick the box. I think competitively this puts you in an extremely weak position. The second type of organisation is the type of organisation who actually understands open data to some level. They really want to engage with it. They're usually very, very excited about it. They want to put systems in place, but they view it as an archival requirement. It's not meeting the mandate, that's secondary to them. This is a good place to be. The archival requirement is one that comes, I think, very much from kind of a, a DSpace or Fedora community, where you want a copy of your stuff. And that's good in a way, but you need to move to an, the level beyond this in order to really meet the growing need of researchers. The most progressive institutions that we find are institutions who really understand the open data problem. And they may not understand the infrastructural issues, they may not understand how to collect the data, but what they are committed to doing is producing tools for their researchers that allow researchers to collaborate internationally and with ease, to share data, to capture the metadata, to capture provenance data at source, to do all of these things that uh, are required to make the research reproducible. And so, unfortunately, the, the institutions that are in the third bucket are, are relatively small in number, simply because of the resource requirements, the amount of thinking that's required to engage at that level with the community. And so I think what we need to start doing, beyond telling people that research data is important, is actually give them a structured manifesto for how to work with uh, research data in the current age. And obviously the RDA does an element of this work, but I think we need to bring something very much to uh, the institutional level, to institutional research administrators, to institutional librarians who are involved in teaching academics how to work, and indeed to the academics themselves. And so I've drafted this, this very simple manifesto. Um, capture early. If you can design your experiment and you can set up your equipment to capture right at the beginning of uh, the process, then do so. Uh, with Figshare, we have a really great example of an academic at Imperial College in London who is in computational chemistry. He's set up his experiment so that it automatically posts the data to Figshare on creation. This is absolutely ideal. It's still then in, a, in an embargoed state. You can work out whether you need to share it, whether it's appropriate to share it. But all of those data automatically go into the system. Capture everything. This, I think, goes to Kevin's point earlier. There are bits that people are embarrassed about or don't want to share. Actually, share it. It, there should be no downside, there should be no reputational risk in doing that. The problem is that there is, and this is something that we as a community have to deal with and work through. Share early. Obviously, be careful about ethics, and a lot of the issues that Kevin was talking about previously were around the ethics of sharing early. Um, we need to be very careful uh, in certain situations. There are certain pieces of data we're never going to be able to share, and that's completely accepted. But once we've defined the rule book and we know what's ethically acceptable, what's appropriate with industrial relations, all of these types of things, we just need to be able to share automatically. And I think the one that probably rings true to many of us in this room, if you have any kind of uh, interaction with academics trying to do any of this, is structure the data. Um, it's great to have data out there. Um, if the data is unstructured, uh, then it's all but useless, of course. I'm mindful that I have one minute left, so I would normally finish with, with the closing thought, but the one thing I want to, uh, want to um, an anecdote I quickly want to tell, is that I was running a conference in London about three or four years ago, and 
uh, I had representatives from about 30 UK institutions and I was doing an exercise where I put a, a controversial statement on the projector and I got people to line up along the room, one side of the room strongly agreeing with the um, idea and the other end strongly disagreeing with the idea. And then I got a, a colleague to go out to them with a microphone and ask them why they'd stood where they had a, across the spectrum. And one colleague uh, walked to the end of the room where he strongly agreed with the statement, my university believes all data should be openly available. And then moved completely to the other end of the room and consequently instantly picked him out as someone who was going to get interviewed. Gave him the microphone and said, why did you move? He said, I thought about it. My institution believes strongly that every other institution should make their data <laughs> openly available. And we heard that in one of the other talks, and I think it's, it's, it's just such a truism and something that we really need to, uh, need to work on across the sector. Um, and with that, I will finish. Thank you. Oh. I think the anecdote is a sufficient closing thought. We need 25 minutes. So thank you. So any questions? I think. Uh, I have one. If anybody has a one. Let's see. I come actually. I'd like to add, if I may, one uh, one phrase to your manifesto uh, to make the data uh, persistent. Because uh, I once um, heard about the paper in about the papers in bioinformatics which publish software database, databases and, and so on, that most of them, like 80%, becomes unavailable in three years. So I think it's crucial not only to share the data, but make sure that it's available. I completely agree. I, I take it as a given, but you're, you're absolutely right. Quick question. So, um, my, my feeling is that there is, there is one strong difference between publications as articles and data sets is the fact that data sets are strongly uh, discipline specific. Mm -hmm. So going for an institutional approach uh, smells to me and rings a bell of archiving, right? Rather than reuse. Mm -hmm. Th that's because of the plethora of stuff that you can find into an archive like that. So researchers will tend to deposit because they can refer to the data from the paper. But if I need to find the data sets alone without going through the paper, so data that is specific for a topic and that I know that I can reuse because I can expect certain uh, structure and certain semantics. It's really hard to find mm -hmm. in this kind of scenario. So yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. Um, from my own training, I'm a theoretical physicist. I post an archive. My expectation is that if I want to find new research in my field, I don't go to institutional repositories, I go to archive to find it. So this is a kind of allegory for, for standard publications, if you will. The approach that we're taking with Figshare is to try to define a base metadata schema, which is applicable for everybody, and then specific metadata schemas for specific subjects, which are available at institutional level. So institutions who engage with us will be able to accept certain metadata schemas for certain different subject areas. And this then means that there's homogeneity of data quality across the piece. This is very tricky to do. 